Welcome to Lecture 5 of BIB 201 Bible Doctrines 1. Today we're going to finish up that section on the canon of Scripture. Let's start by talking about various terms related to canonicity. The first term I want to highlight is what we call the Old Testament Apocrypha. We talked about that in the last lecture, but now we're going to get into a little bit more detail on that. Letter A, this word apocrypha means something hidden, something that we didn't previously know. Well, what is that even talking about? What is something hidden? This is in reference to that time period between Malachi and Matthew, when you have about a 430-year blank period. And that was all a part of God's plan where he was silent with his people until he sent his son. Well, what happened during that time? That is when, if you look at letter B, we see that list of books that are considered apocryphal. All of those books give us some really good information about what happened historically between Malachi and Matthew and what was the thinking of the people in terms of their literature and what they were writing about. Because you can determine a lot about a people group by what they write about. So those books, again, we talked about this last lecture, are helpful literature, but not to be used as inspired scripture. They're not considered canon. What's some further evidence that they should not be considered canon? Well, look at letter C. Neither Jesus nor any of his apostles accepted these as canonical, and they never referenced them in any way. This right here is some great support for not including them in the inspired scriptures because Jesus never quoted from them and neither did any of his apostles. If they did not quote from them, then that gives a lot of negative light upon using them, or not using them, period, but including them in the scriptures. And not only that, letter D, Judaism has never accepted them as a part of the Old Testament canon. And remember, Whose book is the Old Testament? It's the Jews. It's their document. We are just piggybacking on the Jewish religion as Christians. This is their document. This is their book. They do not see it as canonical. I think we should probably keep our hands out of it. And not only that, but letter E. These were rejected as canonical until the Roman Catholic Council of Trent in 15. 1946. So you'll notice for over a thousand years they were not accepted as scripture until the Roman Catholic Council of Trent. And now I mentioned this in the last uh, lecture. While the Council of Carthage appeared to have approved these books, commentaries on the councils by Jerome and many others show that they all were only allowed to be read for ecclesiastical purposes and not inspired. So they were used for helpful literature, but not to be our rule of life. So the verdict of the first four centuries remained the verdict of the church during all of the Middle Ages. One of the first things reformers undertook was actually to break from that ecclesiastical authority, and they did this by substituting the infallible Bible for that infallible church. The Council of Trent was trying to show that the church got to say, we can add these books in there now because they line up with some of our beliefs. But the reformer said, no, we're going to stick with the Bible and what it says. Now that we've talked about the Old Testament Apocrypha, let's turn to the second term related to canonicity. And it's my favorite word in theology, homologamina. Now the word homologamina, I'm not speaking in tongues, it means acknowledge. It's Greek for homo meaning same, homo same, lageo is thinking. It's the same thing. These are the acknowledged scriptures that no one disputed about whether or not they should be included in our New Testament, which is letter B. They are the indisputable universally accepted books of the New Testament and say, well, what are these? This includes every New Testament book from Matthew through Philemon and then first and, and first Peter and first John. So Matthew through Philemon, first Peter and first John, which means that leaves out seven books in our New Testament, which those seven books are called number three, the Antilegomena. 
The word anti-legomena means disputed. Anti means against, and legao is thinking. It was against the thinking of the church. They had disputes over these books, and some of their disputes were valid for a time until they really got in and researched them. And I've already told you there are seven of them. So let's talk about those seven books that were a part of the anti-legomena and why they were so disputed. The first one is the book of Hebrews. And if you can guess why the book of Hebrews was so debated, you probably guessed correctly that it's because we have no idea who wrote it. In fact, what ended up happening was they just said, you know what, whoever wrote it was probably either an apostle or someone closely associated with an apostle, but we're just going to say Paul wrote it, so no one really will debate with it. Now, did Paul wrote it, write it? We don't know. We really have no idea. In fact, I personally would not lean towards Paul writing it, but there are some really good arguments that he did. Either way, whomever wrote that book knew a great deal about Jesus and Christianity, Jewish customs, the Ju uh, Judeo-Christian concepts and worldviews, and they were someone definitely closely associated with Christ and with the disciples. And then number two is the book of James. Now, why was the book of James so disputed? Well, it's because of the issue of faith and works. If you look at James, just read it with a cursory glance, it does appear that there is a passage in the book of James that makes it almost seem like he's saying that we're saved by works. In fact, this book was even so D disputed by Martin Luther about a thousand years later that he was still trying to keep it out of the New Testament because he was trying to get away from any Catholic teaching. But the Council of Carthage, when they studied the book of James, they realized James was not saying we are saved by works. He was not contradicting Paul's teaching of salvation by grace through faith. What he was saying was, if you really are saved, you will produce good works. James says, okay, you say you're saved, show me. That's what he was trying to emphasize with the people at that time. Not that you're saved by works, but that if you really are saved, you're going to do good works. Now let's look at number three. The third book that was disputed, a part of the Antilegomena, was 2 Peter. And this actually was disputed more than any other New Testament book because of its dissimilarities with 1 Peter. And they believe that it might have been written after Peter's death. However, when they studied 1 Peter compared to 2 Peter, the similarities far outweighed the dissimilarities. Just like this picture, if you only focus on the differences, you will not realize it's actually the same thing, same picture with some minor tweaks into it. So, it ended up with Origen, Eusebius, Jerome, Augustine, they all said no. This right here should be kept in because it is so similar to 1 Peter. Then number four is actually two books together, 2nd and 3rd John. Now 2nd and 3rd John was disputed because the author calls himself an elder rather than an apostle. Now this right here, at, at first glance we would think, well what's the big deal? Well, John usually called himself an apostle, and actually the apostles usually called themselves apostles. The very thing that helped them realize that this truly was John's writing was when they compared 2nd and 3rd John to 1st John, Revelation, and the Gospel of John, and they, they saw, again, so many similarities. And not just that. Remember, 1st Peter is a part of the homologomena. I just wanted to say that in there. And in 1 Peter 5 verse 1, guess what Peter calls himself? That's right, he calls himself an elder. So they realize if there's so many similarities between 2nd and 3rd John and 1st John, and Peter himself called himself an elder, then this one should be included as well because it really was written by John the Apostle. Then number 5, the book of Jude. Now, the book of Jude was disputed because it quotes from the book of Enoch and possibly what's a book called The Assumption of Moses in verse 9 of Jude. However, they studied this book and compared it to Paul's accepted scriptures, you know, the homologomena, 
And they found that Paul even himself quotes from pagan poets. So they realized that a quotation from a book in Scripture is not necessarily a condoning of a book. Think of it this way. If you've ever listened to a teacher or a preacher, many times they will use an illustration that is secular. When I say secular, not in the Bible. They'll use a personal illustration or an illustration from history. Now, by using that illustration, you don't throw out the entire message because they weren't quoting scripture. Scripture. That's what's happening in the book of Jude here. So, they reference a, a, reference a portion of work that does not mean that it entirely um, throws out what he was writing. So, again, we can quote somebody without it, you know, going away from the message of the gospel. And then the final book that was a part of the, the Antilogomena was number six, Revelation. And this one doesn't take much thought. It was so disputed because of its prophetic tones. Now, and again... While 1 Peter was the most disputed one, or excuse me, 2 Peter was the most disputed one, Revelation was disputed longer than any other ones. So this one just took a little bit longer for them to decide it, even though first or 2 Peter got a little more heated. And it was disputed longer because of that prophetic nature. But what ended up happening is because they knew John the Apostle wrote it, they embraced it as being canon, the rule of our life. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 5. Hope you enjoyed it. If you need anything, please do not hesitate to contact me.